So I finally finished making video essays on all three games in the STO collection this past month. But if you bought the actual collection, you would know that there is a part 4 to the story of Ezio, and it is so much more heartbreaking than I remember. It truly makes Titanic look like a children's movie. I mean, even the opening scene just tugs on your heartstrings. I am taking Marcello into town. <sighs> to see Machiavelli's play. Ezio, his play closed three weeks ago. I missed it. We are visiting your sister. Keep an eye on Flavia, okay? Seeing Ezio start losing his memory is something that I was not ready to see. Ezio has always been that cool guy who always just stood on business and he was always the one to handle his own problems. So when Ezio starts to show signs of not having full control of his life and he is really starting to slow down, it just hits you like a plane hitting a tower. But I also love how Ezio and Sofia are still together, but I'll talk about Sofia in a bit. And I love how we do get mentions of Machiavelli. Good to see that the gang is still doing big work. We actually got to see Machiavelli all the way back in Assassin's Creed 2. So technically, he's been with us since like day 2. So it's always cool to see a real one thriving. Ezio also has kids with Sofia, Flavia and Marcello. Flavia is the one who sounds like Ezio's sister Claudia and is the one who almost gives Ezio a heart attack. Flavia. But you meet Jun who is a Chinese assassin who is begging Ezio to give her guidance to rebuild the order and Ezio is like nah I'm gonna do my own thing and I can't blame Ezio. He's retired. He took down three generations worth of Templars and he has no more fight in him. That's why at the end of Assassin's Creed Revelations he says this. Another artifact. No. You will stay here. I have seen enough for one life. Ezio truly has done it all. When you look at Altair, when he became an elderly old man, Altair still had to fight, but they weren't new fights. It was just tying up loose ends that he needed to tie up. Altair had not actually finished his fight yet, so in Revelations, when Altair goes after a bus and the assassins rally with him, after that, Altair literally does the same thing as Ezio, where he doesn't go to like Jamaica or something, and is like damn, these Jamaicans are out of control, I need to bring the assassin order up in here. No. Altair stabilizes what he can, and then he let himself die to be picked up by Ezio. Now don't get me wrong, I still think that Altair's final years were a lot better than Ezio's final years, simply because Altair's death still made a huge impact in the canon. I mean we literally play an entire game just to find out what was going on in Altair's later life. I'm not trying to suck Altair's skeleton cock or anything, but I still think his final years were more impactful inside the canon than Ezio's final years. But Ezio does have a cool reflecting moment with Sophia, and it's pretty insane. How naturally Ezio develops in like a 20 minute conclusion episode. Are you okay? I cannot seem to leave my past behind me. I started this act of my life so late, Sophia. I knew I would not have enough time to do everything. Now I worry I do not have enough time to do anything. But yeah, I'm so happy Sophia's with Ezio, and they didn't replace Sophia with another random woman. And I'm happy they didn't go for that Star Wars angle, where after a huge time jump, they made the couples not have a happily ever after, so that's good. And Sofia did seem perfect for Ezio, and I also gotta say man, all of Ezio's relationships are written so well. Like you have Sofia, who plays a major role in Assassin's Creed Revelations, and then Assassin's Creed Embers. Then Ezio has Katarina Forza, who plays a big role in Assassin's Creed 2, and Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. And if you played the side missions in Brotherhood, you would also know that Christina, the same girl that Ezio rises up in the opening of EC2, Christina! Christina! Who's there? Me! Oh! Ezio! I should have known! May I come in? Fine, but only for a minute. A minute is all I need. Indeed. Well, wait. Uh, that came out wrong. Christina is also in Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. She's in those memory side missions, and she plays a major role in them. 
and Ezio and Christina did love each other, so all of Ezio's relationships are really well written, and they aren't just flings that Ezio has every now and then. They seem pretty realistic since Ezio dies an old man, and most people do usually have three relationships in their lifetime. But Ezio tells June, Alright, I'll help you out a little. And they go to Firenze, and man, it really is the same Firenze we know and love from Assassin's Creed 2. We see the tower that our dad got imprisoned in, we also stay where he and our brothers got hanged, and the whole thing just pulls your heart out. Like you had a totally different perspective with older Ezio than you do when he was just a horny little teen. I also love how the people here are almost identical from Assassin's Creed 2. I know it's kind of an easy thing for Ubisoft to do, but if they didn't do that, it just wouldn't hit as hard. Because this whole scene just hits man, and we also get some action, and some truly brutal action on top of that. That knife boot thing was really cool, but it was during this scene that I kinda realized that this art style is very similar to Star Wars The Clone Wars. They might not have the same filter on, but the animations look very similar. I don't agree that Assassin's Creed Embers looks like an anime. I see a lot of people say that, but that might just be because the only anime I've ever watched is Attack on Titan, so I might not have the most insight on anime. But I also don't think that's the reason, because I've watched hundreds of hours of hentai in my life, and this does not look anything like hentai. Like trust me I'm an expert on that stuff. But Ezio is getting understandably frustrated, since he just literally wants to live in peace and make sure his children are safe. But he says goodbye to them, and starts to teach June about things. And it was really cool seeing him reflect on the big moments in his life. When I fought the Borgia, revenge drove me forward. And my first impulse was to aim for the head. In time, however, I learned that those who inspire fear have more devoted followers than those who preach love. Killing Rodrigo and Cesare would have accomplished nothing without some equal measure of fraternity. But the enemies come to Ezio's house, and now we get to see Ezio in action. This whole thing was very eerie, because you don't know how much Ezio can take. Someone could just spit on Ezio, and that might just be enough. Or at least I thought so, because we don't know how fragile Ezio truly is. But this is big dig monster cock Ezio we are talking about, so he did not back down from a fight. When this big brute looking dude showed up, I was like yeah, Ezio good luck, but you were cooked here my friend. But nah, Ezio showed up in overtime and clutched it up on a breakaway. This whole battle feels like a WWE wrestler or a boxer coming back for one more. But Ezio does put up a performance, but he did have a real death scare that made me punch my wall, thinking that he died. But Ezio also gives her this thing. Here, this may be of use one day. No, only if you lose your way. Now apparently that box is the same precursor box that Shay from Assassin's Creed Rogue touches and all that crazy stuff goes down. Apparently it's the same one. Now I haven't played Assassin's Creed Chronicles, I'll probably put it in my to-do list, but if that fact is true, and it's an actual fact, that's actually insane man. Like having Ezio touch the same box that Shay touches, and acknowledged by people like Achilles and hate them, it's actually insane writing. Like I want that to be true so bad. So if you're an Assassin's Creed nerd beta male who gets no pussy like me, let me know down below if this is true. I don't really mind spoilers. But Ezio goes back to his home in Firenze, and the moment happens. You should have stayed home. I am home. We will be right over here. Al diavolo. I hate this damn city. I wish I was in Rome. I hear the women there are, hmm, like ripe Sangiovese on the vine, you know? Not like here, Firenze. I don't think Firenze is your problem. Prego? <coughs> Coraggio, vecchio. <sighs> Get some rest, huh? 
Ezio dies. Man, this is brutal. Like, in my opinion, Ezio's death, Arthur Morgan's death, and Ned Stark's death, I think those will forever be my top three when it comes to being a big crybaby right after. Ezio just hit so hard. Apparently, this guy who is sitting next to Ezio, he is basically a manifestation of Ezio's younger self, and it does make sense. There's also a theory that this guy isn't even real and Ezio is just hallucinating him, but I don't really believe that. That seems a bit too dark for Ezio's ending, and I don't think hallucinations and Ezio are something that have ever been hand in hand. I can see what people think it is, because it makes it more entertaining, but nah, not me, man. But what makes Ezio's ending so perfect is that Ezio dies, where his dad and his brothers died. The event that led Ezio to do what he does for the rest of his life was the same spot where Ezio comes back and dies, and he dies in the opposite way of them. There was no betrayal here, there's not much work to be done. Death is sad, don't get me wrong. But this is so much closer to a normal death than what happened to Ezio's family, but just a 10 out of 10 ending from him. And then we get my favorite speech of all time. When I was a young man, I had liberty, but I did not see it. I had time, but I did not know it. And I had love, but I did not feel it. Many decades would pass before I understood the meaning of all three. And now, in the twilight of my life, this understanding has passed into containment. Love, liberty, and time, once so disposable, are the fuels that drive me forward. And love, most especially, mio caro. For you, our children, our brothers and sisters, and for the vast and wonderful world that gave us life and keeps us guessing. Endless affection, Mio Sofia. Forever yours, Ezio Auditore. Now, I said before that my favorite gaming speech is at the end of Assassin's Creed 2. And that probably still is because the Assassin's Creed Embers technically doesn't count as a video game, but overall this speech is fantastic. It's basically the opposite of AC2 speech. In Assassin's Creed 2, he is talking like he had everything figured out, but decades later, he now knows that he had nothing figured out, and never will, and probably no one ever will, and it's just beautiful. Like this man is a legend, easily one of the best video game characters of all time, and nearly half a decade later, Ubisoft still haven't topped Ezio. Because how can you write a better story than a character who has been fleshed out for three entire games and a mini anime hentai episode after? You just can't. It is a good life we lead, brother. <sighs> the best. May it never change. And may it never change us. I have completed every part of Ezio's story, so go watch those videos if you haven't. And now that I completed all of them, I can finally give my reviews to all of them, which I honestly just forgot to do. But Assassin's Creed 2, I'm giving a 9.3 out of 10. Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, I'm giving an 8.2 out of 10. And Assassin's Creed Revelations, I'm giving an 8.7 out of 10. All phenomenal games. I don't think I'm gonna give a rating for Embers, since it's not really a game. But yeah. I had a blast this past month making video essays on these games. But yeah, that's it for this video. Like, subscribe, and peace, peace.